see you there. And that's all for now. Get all the details by going to our website and looking up the What's Happening link. Now you're in the know. Well, good morning. My name is Deanne and I'm a worship leader here. We're so glad that you were able to come out and join us this morning as we worship together. If you're able to, please stand with us as we celebrate our God together this morning. Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild, and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is.
doing this morning? Good. You made it through the snow. Welcome to church. Why don't you say hello to someone around you and squish in just as everyone's kind of getting in because we know it's a little crazy outside. We'll be back in just a minute.
ages I'm standing on your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm calling on the Holy Spirit Almighty River, come and fill us again. Come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. The Holy Spirit is on the move today. He's always on the move, whether we're aware of it or not. Some of the ways in which he moves in us and works in us is by healing us, mending our brokenness, strengthening us, and challenging us to be more like Jesus, inviting us into experiencing his presence more fully. I invite you to open your hearts more to him today. Surrender to him the pieces of your life and your heart that you're holding back and watch him move more powerfully in you and through you. Just have a presence of in inviting the Holy Spirit to be with us today. There's nothing worth more then we'll ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence lord i have tasted and seen of the greatest of loves where my heart becomes clean and my shame is undone in your presence lord holy spirit you are welcome here come fly Oh, 
flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Father God, that is our prayer this morning that we would be overcome and overwhelmed by your presence, by knowing that you are here with us, not just today in this room, but every day, every minute, you are there with us. God, we ask for an openness this morning. We ask that you would come into our hearts and our lives and that you would fill all those corners where we feel hopeless, where we feel shame, where we feel afraid and alone. God, we ask that you would come and fill us. We ask that you would open us to, to see what you would have to do in our lives, to hear what you would have to say to us this morning. God, we pray for that openness, for your grace, for your spirit, for your peace to flood in. God, we ask all of these things in your powerful name. Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning, everybody here in Waterloo. Welcome, everybody that's watching online. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. And you're joining us for the beginning of a six-week series called Open to the Spirit. And in this series, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about lots of theological ideas, and we're going to get really deep. But today is a soft introduction, because I know for some of us, this is maybe a scary topic. Maybe this is a foreign topic. And so I thought, let's start as simply as I can with the question, are you open to the spiritual? Are you open to the spiritual? Are you open to the idea that there is a spirit among us in this room right now, or whatever room you find yourself in right now? Are you, are you open to that idea? Or are you closed? I was thinking this week about simple things that we all do in our lives. Simple things that, that we would say, well, that's a part of life. Things like breathing. Breathing is a part of life. To be alive, you need to be breathing. And so, uh, so I thought about breathing. And I thought some people would just explain breathing and they'd be like, yeah, it's like there's these muscles down here and they, they contract and that opens up our lungs and then gases come in and then there's an exchange of those gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, and then, and then these muscles release and then that pushes the gas out. And that's, that's breathing and that's, that's something that is scientifically observable and measurable and repeatable in all human beings. And, and what life is, is it is a complex arrangement, a collection of repeatable things that are happening inside of our bodies moment by moment. And for some people, that, that's, that's enough. That's, that's the world that they live in. The world that is observable, measurable, repeatable. What kind of world do you live in? Do you live in a world where like everything's kind of got to be like that? And that's how, I think, that's how I think about the world. I look for like, what can I observe and understand? And so for some people, breathing is just that. It's just this thing that our body does and we can, we can explain it scientifically. But for other people, when we talk about breathing, they would say, yeah, there's that, there's that whole explanation of sure what's physically going on, but but there's also this deeper thing that seems to be going on when I, when I breathe, particularly like if I just 
close my eyes and I, and I breathe. It's, it, feels like, it feels like breathing is also like a metaphor for something. It feels like when I really focus on my breath that I'm brought somewhere else, that I, that I become rooted somewhere else, that, that I realize my utter dependence on something that is external to me. And so, so breathing, yes, there's this physical explanation, but there's also this spiritual thing that happens. Which of these worlds do you live in? What kind of, what kind of world do you see when you look around, when you try to make sense of the world? What is, what is your worldview when it comes to the physical and the spiritual? And however you answer that question, has your answer brought you peace? Has your answer brought you to a place where I am at peace with this view of the world? The author Ronald Rollheiser, which I didn't realize until this morning is quite the tongue twister. You go home and try to say it later. Ronald Rollheiser opens up his book called The Holy Longing, and he says this very simple statement. He says, it is no easy task to walk this earth and find peace. Such a simple observation. And yet I read it and it hit me this week. It is no easy task to walk this earth and find peace. And yet it is what each one of us is trying to do. Maybe you put, never put this language to it, but this is what we're trying to do. Every moment, what is the thing that I need to do that will bring me peace, that will give me a sense of like, okay, I'm finally home. I can finally be at rest. Rollheiser in his book talks about how we are all like, we, have, well, we all have this energy. We all have this unrest about us. We all have this dis-ease about us. And what we have to do is make a decision about what will we do with our unrest? What will we do with our energies? And hopefully the thing that we do will bring us to a place where we find peace. Well, you probably already know this, but the Christian tradition, the tradition that follows Jesus, has a worldview and tells a story in our scriptures that is soaked in the spiritual. From the very beginning, from the very opening lines of the narrative that we call scripture, we find that the spirit is at work and present. The opening lines of Genesis say this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the very beginning, imagine if you've never read this book before. You've never heard about this book before, and you're just like, let's go, let's go, page one. What are we talking about here? We get a description of, of the world, the earth is formless and empty, and there's darkness over the surface of the deep. We get, we get a picture of chaos and disorder and darkness. And into this picture comes the Spirit. Now, you have no idea what that even means. You're just like, okay, so something, someone, some, some force of some, some sort comes and begins to hover over this chaotic darkness. And then as you read throughout the rest of this narrative, begins to create and bring beauty and order from this darkness. It would have you asking questions like, well, what, what? is this then this 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 let's let's call it a personal energetic presence that seems to emanate from god himself this personal energetic presence that brings order and beauty into the world what what is that this story seems to want to tell me that this whatever this is has been present from the very beginning and the words that the people that are writing this story, the word that they use to describe this is a fascinating word. It's the word ruach, ruach. And it is also used to describe wind, breath, and spirit. Which is interesting to think that as they're telling this story and they have the whole category of words that they could use to describe this thing that was hovering over the surface of the deep in the very beginning, and they choose this word, that also means wind 
and breath. And some have noted that perhaps this is just an intuitive choice by them. They, they realize like when we breathe, like what is sustaining all life on the planet is, is our ability to breathe. It is our breath. They, they would have noticed that, that every once in a while there is something that moves the leaves and the trees, that, that sometimes these winds come. And, and so they, they, they simply recognize that there, there is an energy at work in the world, an energy that is even sustaining life within each living creature in the world. And they're simply saying, so wherever that comes from, we're going we're gonna to attach that to what we call God. And they call it Ruach. In the Psalms, which is a collection of poems and prayers in the middle of the Bible, it's the biggest book in the Bible, we find some poetic language about the Spirit. And I want to just read for you a bit of it to help you wrap your head around how they are thinking about Ruach in the Old Testament. The writer of Psalm 104 says this, All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. So there's this image of like God is the one who's taking care of the creatures. When you hide your face, they're terrified. And when you take away their breath or ruach, they die and return to the dust. So, so how are they living in the first? Well, this God had given them his ruach. And when he takes it away, they die. When you send your spirit or ruach, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. From the very beginning, you get this, this story, this worldview of there is some personal energetic presence at work in the world. It, it, is, it is connected to our breath. It is connected to the wind in the trees. It is the thing that is sustaining all living things on the earth. And if you were to keep reading then throughout this narrative of scripture, you would find that something happens with this ruach, that, that it doesn't just stay out there, that every once in a while this ruach comes and fills people, rests upon people, rests upon big names in the Bible, people like Joseph, and you know, you know Joseph in his magic technicolor dream coat. The Pharaoh notices, this guy, he's super wise. He can tell us what dreams mean. He is filled with the ruach. The Spirit will come and rest on great leaders like Moses. The Spirit will come and rest on great kings like David, prophets like Elijah and Ezekiel, messengers of God. The Spirit comes and rests on these people. But you know what I love about the Spirit is that he, he doesn't just rest on the big names, on the kings and prophets and priests. He also comes to smaller names, people that are just artists. There's a moment in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, where God wants a tabernacle built where his presence will dwell. And listen to what, how it's described, uh, what, what will be given to the artists who are going to make everything that will go into this tabernacle. In Exodus 31, we're told this, then the Lord said to Moses, see, I've chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I've filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. You find throughout the Old Testament narrative that the Spirit comes, the Ruach comes upon kings and leaders and prophets and upon artists to do crafts. Isn't that, I just love the, the, the word craft. This, the Holy, what's the Holy Spirit? What's, he, what's the Spirit of God doing? He's helping me make some crafts. When the Spirit comes, he brings out the best in humans. He brings out wisdom for humans. He gives wisdom to humans. We find great leaders emerge, great kings emerge, great works of art emerge when the Spirit comes upon humans. But the thing is that it's limited, that these moments are finite, that, that the Spirit will come upon them, but, but that they, they, don't, they don't continue to walk with him their entire lives. 
And so what eventually comes to emerge throughout the Old Testament is a prophecy that imagine if one day, imagine if one day somebody came and that person was filled with the Spirit from the very beginning and were open to the leading of the Spirit every moment of their lives. Imagine if there was one upon whom the Spirit of God came and rested for his entire life. Imagine what that would look like. Imagine what that human would look like. Imagine what that person would do. And this person that was prophesied in the Old Testament is the person, Jesus. And so of all the things that we could say about Jesus, and there's a lot, and if you come here every Sunday, you'll hear us say a lot about Jesus. Today, I just want to focus on this one perspective on Jesus, which is that he is our example of what it looks like to live a life that is filled with the Spirit your entire life. Maybe you haven't seen this perspective on Jesus before, so let me read you just a couple verses. John, when he writes about Jesus, referencing John the Baptist, he says, then John, meaning John the Baptist, gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. This is talking about when Jesus was baptized, that he saw the Spirit come and remain on Jesus. And when Peter, Peter, one of Jesus' followers, gives a sermon about Jesus after his death and resurrection, he says this about Jesus. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Luke tells us that when Jesus begins his ministry, that he finds in the scroll of Isaiah these words to launch his ministry. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. This is how Jesus chooses to begin, chooses to announce himself. Who, who is this? Who is this Jesus guy? He is one upon whom the spirit rests. Luke also tells us at the beginning of chapter four that the Holy Spirit comes and fills Jesus and then leads him into the desert. And we're told in several places in the gospel that the Spirit is the one guiding Jesus. The Spirit is the one who gives Jesus the power that he has to heal and face off against demons. The Spirit is the one who empowers Jesus to do all of the winsome things that when we see Jesus and we hear Jesus, we go, man, I love Jesus. Man, he's compelling. What is that about him? It's that he's filled with the Spirit of God. I want you just to see that perspective. There's lots we say about Jesus. But today, just to see that perspective, Jesus was spiritual. I wrote that down in my notes, and I was like, this feels weird to say, but I'm pretty sure that's what we would say. Jesus is spiritual. No, Jesus Jesus is just a good teacher. You can't read him. We can't read the accounts of his life and come away with just a good teacher. He, He was spiritual. And he said of himself that he was filled with the spirit that was guiding him and empowering him. It is this spirit that made him fully alive. There's an old play called Our Town that was written about 100 years ago. And in this play, I don't know a lot about it. I read about it in another book, but, but I read enough to kind of get a sense of it. And I just want to show you a quote from it that is really powerful. But as far as my understanding goes, the, this, this play, part of it is about a young woman who after giving birth to her second child, she dies. And when she dies, she's kind of like, she's talking like she's in like the land of the dead and she talks to other dead people. And eventually she asks like, can I come back for one day to live with my family? And she asked the stage manager. And so it's kind of like there's like a, four, a breaking of the fourth wall and like the stage manager of the play is allowed to like take people and put them back in the play. And so he takes her and she's like, okay, you can come back in the play for one day. And then she lives this life with her family for one day. And after this day, she says this to the stage manager. We don't have time to look at one another. And then she starts crying. I didn't realize. So all that was going on, we never noticed. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every, 
every minute? Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every, every minute. And then the stage manager says, no. The saints and poets, maybe, they do some. I thought about this quote this week and I realized Jesus did. Jesus realized life every moment that he lived. And this is why we find him so compelling. And the thing about Jesus is that he doesn't just say, look at me. He says, this life that I'm living, filled with this spirit, with this breath, with this life, with this wind, I actually came to model it and then to give it to you. The writer and pastor and theologian Scott McKnight says it this way, that, that Jesus at his baptism is plunged into the waters, and then he comes back up out of the waters, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him, and then he will go and be one who baptizes others in the Holy Spirit, plunging them into a whole new way of life. Over the next six weeks of this series, this is my hope for each one of us is that we will find that we are being plunged into a whole new way of life where we are open to the Spirit in ways that we have never been before. And I realize that in a room like this and with everybody watching online, we're all on completely different places in the spectrum of openness to the Spirit, familiarity with the Spirit, closeness to the Spirit. And so for those who find themselves like, this is, I don't know, I don't know any of this spiritual stuff. Like I came to learn some like principles for living. I didn't come to open myself to the Spirit. Well then, let me back up one step and just ask you, are you satisfied with life? Have you found all the peace that you think that there is to find? Or are you perhaps a little bit thirsty for more? And if you're thirsty for more, if you're, if you're at all curious that there might be more, then I invite you to take a step to be a little bit more open to the Spirit. This language of thirst is language that we find used in the Gospel of John. And John gives us this great narrative of a, of a time when Jesus meets a woman at a well. And he meets her there in the middle of the day. And he's all by himself and she's all by herself. And when they meet, it's the middle of the day. And so you get this picture of like a hot day. And it says Jesus is tired. And so you get this picture of, of two people that like are physically thirsty. And when the woman approaches Jesus, Jesus says to her, hey, could you give me something to drink? To which she says... Uh, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, so we don't usually talk. Also, you're a man and I'm a woman, so this is probably rather un inappropriate. And she's, so she's a little bit like, why are you asking me for something to drink? To which then Jesus launches into the setup, I think, that he was setting up for her. He says, actually, you know, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water. To which she's a little bit like, uh, you don't even have a bucket. And also this well was made by our ancestor Jacob. And so do you think you got better water than what the water he's got? Like, like you got some bottled water, Jesus? Like, to which then Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks this water, meaning water from this well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. This is such a fascinating conversation because there's two levels of what's happening here. There is a physical level and there is a spiritual level. The woman is talking about physical water came here looking for water. You said you got good water. You said you got such good water. If I got that water, I wouldn't even have to ever come back here again. That'd be great. And Jesus, Jesus isn't talking about the physical. He's talking about a spiritual water, living water. 
And what we eventually realize later on in the story, just a few lines from this line, is that this woman has all kinds of spiritual baggage. She's been married five times. She's, she's likely been abused in these marriages. She's coming to the well in the middle of the day, which means that she is an outsider to her own community because usually people would come together in the cool of the morning of the day. And so she's by herself and she's got all these problems. And Jesus stands before her and says, I've got, I've got something that can take away that thirst that unrest that you have. I've got something that will bring you the peace that you're looking for that you didn't know that you even came to this well looking for. Now, I've heard this story many times and I've preached this story many times and, and I've often thought that when Jesus talks about this living water that he's talking about some sort of like belief in him, right? He's talking about his, like when you meet me, like if you realize who I am and, and, there, and then that is what he means. So he does mean like if you come into a relationship with me, then you'll have this living water. But, but more specifically, living water is an idea that just a couple chapters later he will attach to the idea that we're talking about this morning. In John chapter 7, look, look for the familiar language. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Same gospel, just a couple chapters later, we get all the same language, thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So similar to what he said to the woman at the well. And then look at what he says, what John tell, tells us Jesus meant in the next line. By this, he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. When Jesus says, I have living water, he's talking about the Spirit. When he says, I have something to give you so that you will never be thirsty again, he's talking about the Spirit. Are you tired of being thirsty? Are you tired of being thirsty? closed. Jesus invites you to open yourself up to the living water that he calls the Spirit of God. What would it mean for you to become more open starting this week and just to begin to learn over the next six weeks of this series? Maybe you're going to have to let go of some experiences that you've had. Because we've all had some experiences where people start talking about the spirit and the spiritual, and that's right when things got weird. Is this the moment when things get super weird? I don't think so. I think this is the moment when we just continue to look at Jesus as our model and say, Jesus, you were, you were so open to the spirit, so filled with the spirit. We want to be like you. Lead me into that sort of openness, that sort of filledness. And maybe you just need to, need to address that in your mind. Oh, I do have categories of weirdness attached to the spirit, but I can't deny that this is a category that I need to embrace because Jesus embraces it. Maybe you have to recognize that you've been looking for living water in lots of other places and have found anything but living water. There's lots of places where you've been looking like, I have an unrest, I have, I have a lack of peace. And so you're trying lots of other things and, and you need to just be honest and say, these are not it. Let me become open to the spirit of Jesus. For some of us, we are followers of Jesus. And yet if we're honest, we're actually like closed Christians. We're closed. Like, we believe all the stuff Jesus told us to be. We're cerebral Christians. You know, we stand, when we're, when we're singing music this morning, we're like, oh, this is a great song. I'm not going to let anybody know what, that I think that, but with my facial expressions or body posture, but wow, I agree wholeheartedly with everything in this song. This is wonderful. Oh, also my legs are tired. Can we sit down? There... <laughs> You are, you are a cerebral Christian. You believe all the right things. Not a bad thing to believe the right things, to believe things. But perhaps you need to confront that and say, but you know what, I've actually become closed to the Spirit. And I want to take a step and just become open and aware. And for some of us, we need to confront that we are afraid 
to be open to the Spirit. Because as you will find next week, the Spirit is actually God. And to open ourselves up to him is to surrender control. And that can be terrifying. To open ourselves up to a God who describes himself as the wind. So perhaps what you need to get yourself to this place is, I'm ultimately more afraid of life without this spirit than I am of life with the spirit. And so I'm gonna open myself up to the God who from the beginning was hovering over the chaos waters, bringing beauty from them and allow this God who is an artist to begin to touch my life and create something beautiful from my chaos, from my darkness, from my mess. And where I think we need to begin, as this is week one of the series, is by slowing down. Ronald Rollheiser has this great line that he says in his book, The Holy Longing. He says, perhaps we are more busy than bad. Perhaps we're more busy than bad. Perhaps we're more distracted than unspiritual. Perhaps, you, perhaps a place to start is to realize you're just so busy and that's where all your problems come from. And that if you could just slow down, you're not nearly as messed up or lost as you thought. Perhaps, perhaps you're more busy than bad, more distracted than unspiritual. Perhaps you're more busy than hopeless. You feel like you're in a hopeless place. Like, I don't know anything could ever help me. And yet that hopelessness just is a result of how busy you are. And if you slowed down and opened yourself up to the presence, to the energy, to the personal energetic presence of God, you'd find, oh, I don't have to be stuck here forever. Imagine if you could wake up every day and say, good morning, spirit. Good morning, spirit. And allow that presence and that peace and that power to fill your lungs. Imagine if in the most intense moments, in the most heated arguments, in the places where you fear to go, the people that you fear to be around, you had this peace because you weren't alone. I wanna invite you this week to take a step to being open to the Spirit and to, to pick three to five times a day where you just sit and do, do a couple simple things. Maybe you, maybe you actually write it on your hand. Maybe you write like an S on your hand and then, then three to five times a day when you see that S, you go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this little practice for a couple minutes and you just, you open your hands to receive and you take a deep breath. And you say, Spirit, I am open to your presence. Help me to see what you want me to see. Help me to do what you want me to do. Spirit, would you help me? Well, imagine if you just began this week, every day, three to five times a day, you did that. I think that you would find that there's this spiritual, energetic, personal person who is there with you, speaking to you, guiding you, leading you. I said, you write an S on your hand, which is something that I do often if I'm worried I'm going to forget something. And so I actually wrote something on my hand today. I do that often in my sermons. If you can catch a glimpse of it, then you'll know where the sermon's going sometimes. But on my hand right now, it says the word left. And it's to not forget that to end this sermon, I want to tell you a piece of how the story of the woman at the well ends. There's this little throwaway line that John tells us. It says that, that after she had this interaction with Jesus and she comes to believe that he is God in the flesh, that she runs away and she leaves her bucket at the well. It's an easy throwaway line, and yet I'm like, John, you put it there. 
Spirit, you inspired John to put it there. Why, why, that, why that line? I think that that line is filled with meaning. She came there looking for water to put in this bucket with a certain kind of thirst, and she leaves there having found something completely other, and so she doesn't need the bucket anymore. That's my hope for us through this series, is that we would find a whole new way of life, life filled with the Spirit of God, and we would leave behind a whole other closed way of life. So let me pray for us before we go. Jesus, we trust that by your spirit, you're in this room and that there's been words that I have said today. There have been scriptures that have been read that have resonated in our hearts. And there's parts of us that, that want so much more. We knew we were thirsty, but we didn't know where to look. And this week, starting today, we look to you. We open ourselves up to your healing, personal presence. And may, may we find that you meet us in the most unexpected ways, in the most unexpected places, just like you met that woman at the well thousands of years ago. And when we, may we find that you are leading us into life, life abundant. Jesus, we pray these things to the Father in your name. Amen. Thank you again for being with us. And thank you, Pete, for that message. Man, as Pete unpacked the Holy Spirit, as we see the working of the Spirit in Scripture, we realize God wants to use, by His Spirit, speak to us right now. Like He's alive and working in this world right now. So I don't know who you are, who's watching, but if you are heard this message today and like the Holy Spirit is a little bit foreign, perhaps a little bit, um, I don't know, a little bit weird to you, don't be afraid. I think one thing we just need to do is trust God and go, God, I just want to know you more. And that God will start to work in you and, and he'll change you and you'll, you'll experience God in a new way. And we hope that this will lead you to loving God in a fresh and new and deeper way. And so, just like Pete challenged us to kind of like take time each day to invite the Spirit, to take time to stop, put the distractions aside and listen. You know, we see in Scripture over and over again how people stopped, had to stop what they were doing and just listen in order to hear God's voice. Elisha and, and even in the Psalms where it says, be still and know that I am God. So sometimes we just need to stop the things in our life to actually hear God. So whatever that is for you, we hope you take time this week to do that. And, and if you want to pray with somebody right here online, you can click that prayer button just below me. We'd love to connect with you. And, uh, or if you want to email us online at creeksidechurch.ca, I'd love to say hi, answer any questions that you may have. And there's one more thing I want to talk about. We uh, do this really cool thing where we get to connect uh, over the screen where you get to watch me. Sorry about that, but uh, we're glad you're here. But if we want to meet face-to-face, I'd love to meet you face-to-face, -face, perhaps, or video-to-video. -video. We're going to have a Zoom meeting next Sunday night. It's going to be around 6 o'clock. It's going to be an hour-long thing where I'd love to get with everybody who's willing to come and just and say hi to everybody and see everybody face-to-face. -face. We're going to talk a little bit about what the message is going to be, but really it's just to say hi. So if you're interested in doing that, send an email to online at creeksidechurch.ca. We would love to send you a link, have you join us. And hey... One last thing I forgot to mention earlier. If you want the notes for this week's sermon, uh, just click on that QR code or look for the notes section in the menu above you. Some of you have a menu. It's a sermon notes. If you want to go in there and just kind of review everything that Pete talked about and read some scriptures that he mentioned if, if you missed it, uh, you're welcome to grab those. They're going to be there all week. In fact, they're going to be there from now until the internet shuts down. But we're glad that you came with us today. And that's it for today. We hope you can join us next week. We're going to go to the next part of this Open to the Spirit series. In fact, we're going to have six weeks of this. We really want to unpack what God wants to do in our lives through His Spirit. So come back next week. We'd love to see you. Take care, everybody. Oh,